And we are back with another Black Window Cream podcast. New episode every single Wednesday and Sunday. I'm your host, Ben Haggerty, a.k.a. Ben Reverse World. And this is episode 44. Today's guest is Shannon Griffin, a beast editor. She cuts all different types of content, including documentaries, music videos, commercials, YouTube content, and more. Shannon has just finished editing two music videos for the musician Olivia O'Brien, which are about to hit, I think, 2 million views, which is crazy. They just came out. She was actually our lead editor on my latest documentary that uh, me and my homie Andrew Sandler directed about the legendary Lewis Howes. Shout out to Andrew Sandler. Shannon has a lot of talent, and she provides many great pieces of advice, tips, and hacks throughout this entire interview definitely get a pen and paper ready to jot this shit down during the episode it is fire if this is your first time tuning into the podcast you're probably wondering what does black window cream stand for black window cream is a private content creator group fueled by caffeine or at least i take my coffee black window cream but you can drink or not drink whatever caffeine you fuck with and still be a part of our community we are a private group on facebook open to creators of all kinds aka if you make videos if you're a photographer if you do marketing managing editing dancing etc 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 all creators are welcome our private group has been growing rapidly we have a shit ton of members working together by sharing content they're asking for feedback they're passing tips and tricks along to one another with the goal of pushing each other to become the best motherfucking content creators on earth and you can join our group if you want to by going to bwnc.com slash join fucking join we would love to have you please join all right that's it enjoy the work week keep creating make sure to tune in every wednesday and sunday for a new black window cream episode and without farther ado i bring to you my interview with shannon griffin and the most epic podcast intro ever created right motherfucking now attention if you stop this podcast recording at any time you will die i don't want to die do you want to live yeah you have 24 hours to share this podcast with five people or you will die. I'm kidding. You won't die. You're just weak shit for not sharing. And the winner of the best motherfucking podcast goes to... Goes to... Black with no cream. What do you think? It's so fucking dumb and so fucking Ben Haggerty. I knew you would say that. And we are back with another Black with no cream podcast. Lit. Today's guest, Shannon Griffin. <laughs> What's up? How are you doing? Good. I'm good. Are you doing good? Yeah, I'm good. We just recorded the same intro the first time, and I just fucked it all up. <laughs> so I made her redo it. But she's my homie, so it's cool. Yeah. Word. So thanks, dude. Um, Shannon, you're an editor. Tell me about it. Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> you. What kind of editing do you do? Uh, let's just get straight to it. No, I, I, I'll like in the intro tell people some of uh your like credits or whatever you want to say it. Yeah. To pr- preset the tone for the podcast yeah but what are some of the projects you've worked on like i know i've i tell them that you've done well, my documentary yeah cool beans uh-huh but what are some projects that you've been working on yeah so i worked on your feature length doc um with you those yes. were great times shout out to lewis house yeah andrew sandler and then um i do music videos i just did two olivia o'brien music videos go watch it on youtube um i've done um which I didn't, what was her, like, what's her big, big song? Did she have a bigger song? Oh, yeah, she had with? a really big song that goes like, I hate you, I love you. I yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah that's, that's It's that a girl. bop. Right. Yeah, so, um, but that was a feature on Nash's song, I think. That wasn't, like, her Oh, it wasn't song. her record? No, no. So these were, like, are these her first singles? Um, on her new album, I think, Got that's it, coming right. out soon. Got so, it, yeah. yeah, so I did her music video for Care Less More. I did I Don't Exist, and both were directed by Andrew Sandler. Boom. And then um, I've done some other music videos, like for Jacob Sartorius. Love that little and kid. Then, yeah, he's great. <laughs> and then um, I've done a lot of assistant editing. I assistant edit for Cassie Brooks Bank. She does lots of, like, really sick commercials. She's super creative. And then um, I just started working with uh, Roxana Baldovin. She's just this amazing woman director that I met um, through JR, who you've had on your podcast earlier. Yep. And then I've also just started working with Ivana Boren, and she's an amazing woman director as well. So, oh. um, yeah, lots of music videos um, and a lot of, like, assistant editing projects here and there. What do you... What would you say is your favorite thing, to the favorite project to edit? What, My favorite projects prefer? to edit... Um, I love doing music videos. Yeah. They're, they're just, they're really fun. Like you can be really creative. There's really no rules. Um, you just have like a lot of freedom and it's always, you know, fun when the music is bopping too, you know? Right. 
the music has to be bopping for it to be a good yeah edit. yeah i like shannon because for the doc side of things even vlogging and she's her attention to detail is so like zoned in like you have a good way to like micromanage multiple things at the same time and cool. to dive deep into that shit which i feel like isn't something a lot of people are good at yeah you know what i'm saying mm-hmm. what do you think that comes from um what comes from what being able to multitask and understand how to like like in a documentary like it's there's so much right there's yeah. so much content there's so much yeah. interviews there's so many interviews there's so many th- words that we need to think about that are being said by different people that we need yeah. to like glue together yeah when you have to take on a project like that i guess how do you you know how can you you're just so fucking good at it like your attention to detail <laughs> is so you. fire so <laughs> I feel like there's a lesson to be learned there. Like there's, I don't know if you had any practices to get very Uh good at that or if that's just a natural thing for you, but. I don't know. Like with the documentary, like even though there are a lot of different elements, like having to organize all the footage, having to transcribe all the footage and having to listen to all the footage, like even though it's a lot of work, like I want to do that. Right. Because I'm interested in it. I want to story tell. I want to be able to tell the best story. So all of that work just comes from the just wanting to do it right you know so i don't really know um you know but you just feel like you have to because i see a lot of people editing and they'll just dive into a project and start looking for they'll just start playing random shit they don't comb through everything and i feel yeah. like that's like a huge advantage when you're creating a film is like you need to know what you have to play with almost. yeah well when i was first starting out i started as an intern on a feature-length documentary that was basically almost done and um I was trying, I was looking for advice and I reached out to this um, editor who edited The Search for General So, who, which is a really great documentary. Yeah, you told me about that. I yeah. Watch that. And um, I asked him, hey, um, do you have any advice for me as an editor? I would love to do what you do one day. And he told me that when you start a feature length doc, you should comb through all the footage, watch it all. Because you can't really form a story without knowing what you have. Right. So that's what the kind of mentality that I had when I was diving into your doc is, okay, I need to watch all the, all the footage, read all the interview transcripts, especially since you guys were so busy. Like I felt like that would be the best way to tackle all the elements. Right. And that's the best way to tell a story. Cause mm-hmm. sometimes like, what if you miss something? Like, exactly. you know what I mean? So that's kind of how I approached it. And that's why I was so diligent about watching all the footage and like get, making sure everything was organized and you know. But I feel like that's something that editors should pay attention to because from an editing standpoint, like that crosses over into every platform. Like right. even even when you talk about commercials, it might seem like there's less footage for commercial, but sometimes they're shooting for multiple days all day long and there's so much to look at. But going through and combing through all that or a music video, looking at every single take, like yeah, I I feel like that just gives you the upper hand. I, feel, I don't know why. I just feel like I've seen it happen a bunch where people hop into a project and they're just the assistant editor stacks everything and mm-hmm. then there's four takes of this performance there's three takes of this performance and they'll just like go through and just start cutting and if they see something that's cool right away it's like they'll take it yeah but they don't look at other options yeah there's definitely like sometimes you don't have the freedom or the time to look through all of your footage you might have a deadline that's super quick um but that definitely helps you or gives you an advantage if so, you have time so okay we can we're gonna talk about this shit a lot so let's step back right you, I want to know kind of how you got to where you are today through your upbringing and everything like that. So where were you born? And then I know you've lived in multiple places. Yeah. Like you've traveled a bunch, huh? Yeah. So you want me to start from let's start the from the, Yeah. Let's hear about it. I want to hear about your childhood and shit. Well, a long, long time ago, humanity trend. was born via the big bang. Just kidding. Oh um, so yeah, I was born in Japan and then I moved to Connecticut shortly after you know, doing that. Mm -hmm. And then I moved to China with my family and, you know, you moved to Connecticut, then to China. Yeah. We, I lived in Connecticut for a couple of years. Um, that was lit. Then I moved to China after that, after my sister was born, that was also lit. And then I moved to Hawaii and then that was also lit. And then, um, I didn't really want to stay on the Island because you kind of get like Island fever. It's so small. And, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I knew that I wanted to go to college. I knew I wanted to go to a major city like LA or New York City because I've always wanted to live there. And then... um, But wait, so bouncing all around, that was like through the ages of 
That born was like till yeah, born high school? born till age 10. 10 when I was 10 I moved to Hawaii. To Hawaii. Yeah. Okay. Damn, you covered a lot of ground. Yeah, I mean, eh, whatever. And then so kind of <laughs> Yeah. And then in high school I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I kind of dabbled in theater and like I did some improv and there is this one class that I took where we did a lot of improv and we were creating we we needed to create sketch videos like funny videos that we would show at the end of our senior year are these the ones that you showed me uh yeah the McDonald's one yeah yeah keep going um so I mean they were hilarious but um in the class like Everyone wanted to film them and come up with the ideas, but nobody wanted to edit at all because mm. everybody hated editing. We all took an editing course like our sophomore year and it was like the most boring class ever. And it really? was terrible. I'm sorry, Mr. Faber. I love you, but it was, it was sorry, boring. Bro. Um, but yeah, so I, I volunteered to edit because I knew that I was going to get an A if I edited all these videos. But like, did you know how to or no? Um, like did Mr. Faber hook it up and teach you at least <laughs> he how ta- to he taught trim us, and cut? Yeah, he taught us iMovie. So yes. that was, you know... That was great. So I edited all of our sketch videos in iMovie. One of our friends did a little bit of the editing in Final Cut 7. And then, I know, it was pretty cool. And then... um, Was it pretty cool to you back then? Or did you not understand, like, how, like, the difference between... Yeah, I didn't know because I was in iMovie. I never used Final Cut 7, so it was definitely intimidating. But anyway, so I spent all of my time editing those videos. I had so much fun. I spent my two free periods and my lunch editing all those videos. It was, like amazing i thought it was really fun and i just got into this flow and then um after i finished them my professor mr doyle shout out mr doyle was like you should really think about editing as like a possible career choice and i was like oh i would never thought of that i didn't even think that that was like possible and then that's when i really started to take it seriously and then i moved to new york because i got into sarah lawrence college which is this great liberal arts school that allows you to choose your own curriculum like they don't have any um what are those called um they don't have prereqs any. yeah prereqs yeah i just didn't <clears throat> sorry i just didn't want to take math but um so that's why i kind of went there yeah fuck math uh, yeah so i went there and then i started looking for internships and interning at places as like an editing intern and that's when i really started taking it seriously so when you were going to the school you knew that you could pick your own courses and that was a nice luxury but you were going there for editing like you thought oh this um, is cool i could learn how to edit or work in well i was thinking about going to film school but i felt like not a lot of schools focused on post-production um, I recently learned from Brian Smaller, this amazing colorist, that Chapman has a great post-production facility and post-production program. So mm. I'm mad that I didn't know about that. But I didn't. I was looking at all these like top film schools, and a lot of them focus on video production right. and directing and writing, which is great. Yeah, but I didn't, wasn't really interested in that. I wanted to do post-production, mm. so I couldn't really find that. And I was like, well, Sarah Lawrence, I'm in New York City area, where I might have access to like um, the industry. Um, so I may not have access to classes that are post-production heavy, but at least I'll be kind of in like the vicinity of the film industry or something. Maybe I can probably get an internship. So that's kind of what my logic was. And there were film classes at Sarah Lawrence. Um, like I took an experimental film class, which is really interesting. And I learned Final Cut 7 and I learned Final Cut, um, 10 there, but a lot of my film editing or editing education happened while working as an intern. In New York City. Was was it like, um, I think when, what's interesting that I think about now, it's like when you talk about like, okay, a post-production facility, if, if it's at Chapman or whatever, mm-hmm. I wonder if they teach like the other, ask, like it's almost like you need to be well-rounded in production in general, right? Mm-hmm. To understand it. Like you come to set and see how the shit's done because you DIT on set. Mm-hmm. So she'll come in like media manage, but she gets to see how the set's done. It also helps you to see how we're shooting and capturing things, right? Mm-hmm. Do you feel like that, that you need things like that to understand how to edit and tell stories? Like, could you benefit from taking classes about filmmaking, even if that's not like you're, I uh, want to do this. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think it's definitely beneficial to take maybe a screenwriting course or a a storytelling um, or even journalism course because um, a lot of when I first started editing, a lot of it was just like, whoa, this looks cool. I want to do that. You know, Um, I took like an experimental film course and we just like made videos and that looked cool, you know, or like we just kind of played around, which is great because experimentation is really important as like a creative. Um, But 
when I really started to understand um, that editing is about storytelling, when I interned for this uh, man, Howard Weinberg at Priority Productions, he's like a, a journalist and he had this feature length doc and I would go in and I would edit like a few things that looked cool, but he was like, this is about storytelling. You need to focus on like what story you're trying to tell. And that's when I realized, oh, like editing, although is great to do when you're like experimenting and doing like really cool effects and stuff, it's actually about telling a story, a compelling story and like reaching people. And that's what I, what I learned at that internship and screenwriting helped a lot when I took like a screenwriting course just for fun because, you know, you love to have fun. I love to have fun, <clears throat> yeah, you know, and character. I was, yeah. And I was interested in this professor, <clears throat> this professor, Rona Mark. Um, she's a screenwriter and she was really cool. So I wanted to take her a screenwriting course and I learned a lot about, you know, like the three act structure. I also learned about, you know, why is this story, this movie story bad compared to this story, which is good. I, I got the opportunity to read other people's scripts and like what they were interested in. So that was like a really cool opportunity. And I feel like if you have the opportunity, even if you are just in post-production, you should definitely think about taking a screenwriting course or even just like reading about storytelling. I was going to say, you can, there's a lot of good books on screenwriting. Yeah, that. Um, I think Andrew talked about this on Justin Odisho's podcast. I think it's called like yeah, Save the Cat. Save, yeah, yeah, yeah Save, the cat. Save the Cat is like, it's based off of the three act structure. And I know there's some filmmakers out there who aren't interested in three acts. They want to experiment and maybe expand that but that's a great place to start yeah like learning that and understanding the balance of how to guide through yeah a journey because of someone's even stories. if even if you're just doing a youtube vlog for example youtube vlogs are like storytelling you it's know like that in a condensed version yeah exactly like when i edit a vlog for golden barbie for example she'll have a vlog about thanksgiving or something mm -hmm. and she'll be like there's a beginning middle and an end and there's like a part where she's like, hey guys, I'm going to, to make the turkey. Yeah. And then the turkey making happens. And then she after the that, turkey. she eats the turkey. Holy shit. And then at the end, she's like, bye guys. So it's like, that's the story right there. You know what I yeah. mean? Even if it's basic and a vlog. Right. So storytelling and taking a screenwriting course or reading a book will definitely be helpful for you. But I don't think you necessarily have to know every aspect of production. No, nah, yeah, you're right. Editor. I see you. I think that that's a super valid point and to understand the art of storytelling is, is so key from an editing standpoint. It's so key. It's so key in every, any lane you want to approach with production. Major right? key. Major key. Yes. <laughs> shout um, out DJ Khaled. Yeah, definitely shout him out. Uh, <laughs> my boy. Uh, how do you go from... Okay, wait. So you weren't done in New York yet. Like you would start... Were you doing like the doc internship and things like that while you were in school? Yeah, so I was... Well, yeah, so I would go to school and then I would try and allocate time to go to the city to work as an intern. And a lot of the times it was like, very, it was unpaid internships, which sucks because going into the city like costs money. But like, how, your school was how far away from like down, like in like Brooklyn and um, Our school and was in Westchester County, which is 30 minutes away from downtown New York City. So you have to take the Metro North to New York City. Mm -hmm. And each ticket for a Metro North ticket is like, I don't even remember because it's been so long, but it's like at least $7 or $14. Is, a metro, is that a train? Yeah, it's a train. It's kind really? of like, yeah. So Damn. there's like different lines. Right. Um, but yeah, look it up on Google. Okay. But yeah, so um, yeah, so it kind of sucks having an unpaid internship because it literally costs money to go into the city, buy a subway ticket and stuff like that. But I still did those internships and I learned a lot and then I would come back after the internship and go to school and like do courses and stuff like that. Yeah. And I mean, I feel like that, would you say that investment into your internships was like very valuable? Yeah, it was super valuable. Like I honestly don't think that I would ever be here without that experience because not only are you like working, but you're like meeting mentors you're learning so much from them right i had an amazing internship at Oreg media in hawaii it's like a wedding um production um and like commercial production studio and they do like i said weddings they do commercials and they do like other little videos and stuff and the guy who owns it jeff Oreg, is like he mentored me so much and it was i learned so much from him and oh, like when was that that was like summer 
um, before junior year, I think, or summer before senior year, my oh, senior year of college. Oh, college. Okay. So yeah. you just went back home. Yeah. Got so it. I went back home for school or from school and then I got this amazing internship at Org Media and I learned so much from him. He just like taught me not only about editing, but just about, I guess, life. He was like really cool. And like he re- he encouraged me to come to LA. Like I was oh, really? just, yeah, after graduation, I was like, oh, maybe I'll just stay in New York and like work at like CBS Sports or, you know, work at NBC and then maybe move to LA eventually. And he was like, yo, like if your end goal is to get to LA, get to LA as soon as possible. Right. Don't go in this winding like pathway or don't take like the easy way out. Just go. And I was like, damn you right <laughs> <laughs> you for sure right yeah so he, like internships like not only do you work you also like you don't you you get work experience but you just get amazing mentors you know depending on how great the in- internship we're using is. that to balance like to build a portfolio as well um yeah so i would do like wedding videos at which i would add to my very measly small portfolio and stuff um just anything to show that i could edit and right. stuff but yeah like I've had great internships, but I've also had terrible internships. Like I had an internship at CBS Sports and I talk about this internship all the time. It was like, it was really bad. Why, um, why no offense, so bad? no offense to CBS Sports. Um, the other, like I, I was so stoked to go to CBS Sports because I thought, oh, I want to work at this big company and be an editor and edit like, you know, all their shit, all their cool stuff. And it was football season. I was so stoked. But when I got there, it was so they didn't give me anything to do. First of all, I just sat there and watched people like they didn't give me any tasks. Watch what people edit. I watch people like manage media. I was in the digital assets department and basically they just manage the media and give it out to the editors. And I thought that that would be cool just to see, you know, how do big facilities manage media and stuff. And it was interesting at first, but it was so boring. They didn't give me anything to do. Like it's a huge company. You're literally just like an ant in this like time in this huge company. And I was like, fuck this. I want to be at a small I, and I realized I wanted to be in a small team and like make an impact and be heard and right. be creative. I didn't want to be in that corporate environment. And it was very, very corporate. So that was like a huge turning point. And sometimes like you need to have like shitty <laughs> internships to realize like what you want. Yeah. The, yeah. I think that the I, the topic of internships is so interesting because I feel like you having to invest your own money to get to the city and to take the train and to probably buy fucking new clothes when you're like oh i'm gonna go to cbs i'm gonna look <laughs> cute tomorrow blah blah and you're going out and buy new outfits and shit and like when you do all that is you investing into your career but then you're maybe not getting out what you want or sometimes you're getting the most out which you could have never predicted yeah so like i feel like it's a it's important to always like i'd I didn't think, I don't think I really caught a check when I moved to LA for like over yeah. fucking 14 yeah. months. It's definitely a great investment if you can do it. Like there are a lot of people who can't do it. Like there's just no possible way, which is really unfortunate, which is why it's so great when there are people who hire internships and like actually pay them and like yeah. give them a chance. Like right. I would love to do that one day when I'm like older and like a boss, you know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. But um, yeah, it's definitely, if you can do it, it's an amazing opportunity. Like you should definitely take it and like it may not pay off right away. Like maybe you invest all this time into this internship, but you're not like making it in like you're not making it yet, but it might pay off later. You know what I mean? You just kind of uh, yeah. have to be patient. I feel like almost if, if you really have the drive and you're willing to put in the time like that, I think that the payout will always come. Like, yeah. So far from my experience, from people around me, like us, Yeah. It, it's everyone, you have to give so much to give, to get anything back or yeah. to expect nothing in return. But most of the time you do. Yeah. And I feel like that's where the. Exactly. Like when I first moved to LA, like I went to like this networking event and, because I was like desperate to meet people. And yeah. I met this guy, Mark, my friend, um, Um, and he, he was kind of like an intern as well. And we were like both interns at the time. And like, I was like, that was such a waste of time. Why did I go to this networking event? I made a new friend. I only met Mark. Yeah. (laughs) Sorry, Mark. But yeah, I only met Mark. Um, but then like Mark had a friend who was a junior producer, um, at like this, I forget this company and she would hit me up every so often after I met her through Mark, she would hit me up every so often being like, Hey, we need an assistant editor on this, like 
a commercial or on this like are you available and it never really worked out like I never went to go work with her but that's kind of like a good example of something that doesn't pay off right away because when I met Mark he couldn't offer me a job right away because he wasn't like a boss or whatever at the time but like later on like as I met more of his friends like his friend who was a producer was able to like hit me up and yeah. stuff so it's like it may not be so obvious like right away well and I think like the idea of building those relationships, because if you look at who you try to intern with, right? Like if you're, your goal is to intern with someone that's doing it right and you aspire to be like most likely or mm-hmm. or to be in their, you know, same channel, I guess, as far as what they're doing. But for me, it's like I look at it like, all right, cool. I see this person. Like when I met Andrew, to me, it was like Andrew came through out of nowhere and I was like, oh, shit, Andrew's really dope. Like I want to work with Andrew. I want to learn from Andrew, all this stuff. So I tried to provide as much value as I possibly could to him, not asking like, hey, like here's, I can get your drone footage. Like, can I get money? It was never like that. I was like, oh, let me just, I could do this. Do you like that? Is that cool? And he'd be like, yeah, cool. Yeah. Adds it to his new music video or yeah. this and that. And I, I think like giving what you can and providing or opening up a door for someone that might not even be looking for it. Cause that's the thing is you could get mentored by someone that's not looking to mentor you. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. we didn't know, I didn't know who you were. And then you came in, I was like, yo, Shannon's tight. Andrew's like, yo, I think she's really dope. I'm like, all right, cool. Let's teach her whatever we can or whatever. And then, and we learn shit from you because yeah, you've yeah. learned all kinds of stuff that we don't know. So yeah. it's like you, you merge, but I think like if you can provide value to someone that you could consider like a possible mentor and find a way to open up a door for them that they may have never seen. But sometimes that includes doing shit for free like Mm -hmm. yeah like when you think about it like you if you would when you think about like would you hire you like a complete rando like if you didn't know who you were like would you hire you i'm sorry that like makes like no sense but like if for example like andrew had no idea who i was when i applied to work with him right so like how can I prove to him that I'm something, somebody that's valuable? You and know to, what I mean? And to make, so Andrew and is our him, friend. Yeah, and to make him trust me. Andrew's a director, producer. He's done a bunch of shit that's dope. He directed Chris Brown's documentary. He did Mary J. Blige's doc. He's, me and him co-directed the Lewis House doc. Um, Tons of great music done videos. a million music videos. He's had over like 10 billion plays. In Amazing producer, super smart director yeah that's my right hand my go-to <laughs> but anyway someone like that okay cool now you understand who she's talking about but like so for you to reach out to because you're the way you got connected to andrew was from him posting on instagram right yeah yeah so and how did you know how were you just following him from yeah randomly um so i after i moved to la i was kind of like in this rut and i hadn't really been doing dope work i was kind of doing like shitty internships here and there and stuff like that doing some freelance for like 100 bucks you know and so i was like how can i like you know get out of this so i was like oh maybe i should follow people like filmmakers on instagram just to like see what they're up to and just to kind of like look at their work and stuff because i was like if i'm scrolling through instagram every day like and seeing like these same images i feel like it'd be kind of cool to like at least see film and so I followed Andrew I fought I followed Postis I followed um you know all these people and um Andrew I was like on my Instagram one day and Andrew posted like oh I need an assistant editor slash like assistant please apply and so I applied and then that's kind of how I got the ball rolling and that's right. how I met Andrew and he gave me like footage to edit in like 48 hours and I edited it in 48 hours. I sent it to him and he said that it looked dope. And then that's how I met him. Which is a great thing. If you are in a position to provide an internship or something or hire someone, I did that same thing with Dave for the black and cream podcast. Yeah. And I put it out there and like had 20 people send back edits yeah. and then, but you did it so quick. Yeah. I think, I think I can't remember what Andrew said he liked about it. It was like very quick. The edit was fire. And maybe did you write anything with it? Um, I wrote, like send him a message or something. Um, maybe like almost like, like a resume. Like, Oh yeah. I sent a resume, yeah, okay. but I think he asked for it. So he did. Yeah. I don't know. Dave sent me like, he, he broke down the podcast for me. It's two different pieces. Cause you were doing like a recap video and he was doing a podcast, but I loved it. Cause Dave like wrote, did a write up, like almost like something you would want to include in a blog about the podcast. And he did it so well and broke it down and then showed me like all these great pointers and all these things that a couple other people submitted their edits. Yeah. I, like anyone can edit a three camera yeah at interview but yeah. like the way you break it down and make social bits and shit he went above and beyond to do that and i was like oh there's something cool about this and then like yeah nine months yeah. later he's toured the world with me and and, and like with andrew like it was um a, unpaid in the beginning but like you said i was willing to go above and beyond for him because i wanted to show him 
that I was capable or that I was hard worker. I wanted him to trust me. And it's like, when you think about it, when you put yourself in Andrew's shoes, you're hiring this rando who you have no idea who they are. They could be a murderer. Um, you know, you always think that she, <laughs> but she like, always thinks that people are getting, when we were, we had an a office and like, we'd be in the office doing the doc. She was always locking the door because there's a we work <laughs> which is we work it's already hard to get into that building and she thought that the people that were out there were gonna murder her she thinks she's gonna get murdered all the time it's very well interesting i'm subject. alive today so you are so am i i don't think we get married and murdered i don't think that's how But it, maybe i'm not murdered because i locked the door but anyways um so, so like anyway, yeah. anyways when you put yourself in andrew's shoes um you are hiring this rando who you have no idea who they are like you don't even know if they're a hard worker mm -hmm. like you kind of have to prove to them that you are hard worker, that you are special. Cause you know yourself that you're sick and that you're unique and that you have this perspective and you want to show the world. But like you, all these other people have no idea. Like you could be like a lazy bum right. for all they know. So that's why I kind of like, it sucks when you have to invest all this time and energy and money into something that may not be, that may not be paid, but that's the kind of phase where you're just trying to show them that you're capable you know right yeah no i agree i think that i'm trying to decide if i want to so before we get to andrew how long how long had you lived in la i was living here i think for like a year or two doing think, the internships and like yeah i moved here and then i had like a couple months where i wasn't doing anything i was like applying to retail jobs um i applied to work at american apparel which i had already worked at by like in new york by the way and they didn't hire me Damn. I had worked at American Apparel before and they didn't hire me. That is didn't they just close like close down? That's probably why. Yeah. They got no bread. They yeah. got no bread. Damn. Um, it's because calling. you didn't hire me. But anyways, um so, anyway. so, so yeah, I was doing like uh I was applying to retail jobs. I wasn't really doing anything sick. Actually I was working at Citizen Skull Productions, which is based in Silver Lake, and I did like a couple freelance stuff. Um, you know, I was just doing like random shit. Nothing that was like really exciting. And then that's when I applied to and met Andrew after well, that time. Had you reached out to anyone else on Instagram? Well, I was, no, I wasn't doing any t anything like that. Like I was mostly applying like via LinkedIn or like Mandy.com or like, you know, stuff like that. Just like all those like shitty jobs that you see on like Indeed.com or like right, right. BuzzFeed, yeah. you know what I mean? Like people don't realize that there are a lot of opportunities on IG. And like once I started following all these people on Instagram, that's when I saw like, whoa, there's like so much opportunity. People are posting jobs all the time. Like I follow tons of filmmakers and content creators and there's constantly posts being like, I need an actor. Oh, I need a gaffer. Oh, I need an assistant, yeah. blah, blah, blah. So I feel like all those jobs are like way better than like Mandy, which was what I was like applying to right. before. I feel like even just reminding people like say you build relationships with those people you run into them or just to like stay on top of them like i don't know how many times like someone says like yo i can do this for you and i'm not looking for it at that time but then like three weeks later i'm like damn i really need a graphic designer and mm -hmm. this person may have hit me but i don't know who that person was but like just constantly staying on top of building your network not being overbearing or whatever but finding a good way to like remember make people remember you mm -hmm. you know what i mean yeah exactly um so as you started working with Andrew, what were the first projects he put you on? Just re was um, it recap stuff? Yeah, it was like recap stuff. Um, I When I started working for Andrew, I was like going to pick up his juice cleanse that one time and then I was going <laughs> <laughs> She'll never forget that. <laughs> I was like, I was like, wow, I am really in LA. I'm going to pick up a juice cleanse as an assistant for like this guy. But anyways, um, That's hilarious. so yeah, I was picking up juice cleanses. She's the editor, Andrew. What well, you got her running and getting your juice cleanse for, bro? You don't need to take a shit that bad. It was really funny. But yeah, I was picking up a juice cleanse. I was doing a lot of like social media stuff, like 30 second IG clips and stuff. Um, what, what promo based stuff or yeah what? like promos like for ryan blair i was doing stuff for him um what else was i doing shoe palace stuff yeah but i was not start till later that was a little bit later but yeah i was doing like i was only meeting up with andrew like maybe once or twice a week right. like it was very very little work but um it was like yeah it was doing social media stuff mostly for ryan blair then we got into music videos yeah and then 
Well, Andrew got me my first music video gig, which never came out, by the way, which, which was very sad. Like, um, Andrew asked me, I came in to uh, meet up with Andrew one day, and he was like, do you want to edit this JoJo music video? And I was like, oh, JoJo? Yeah. Like, the JoJo? Like, it's too little, too late JoJo? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, oh my god, absolutely. And then <laughs> it was directed by Wilmer Valderrama, which was a trip, because I was like, I grew up on him at, with that 70s show. That 70s show. Yeah. As if everyone's not fucking mm-hmm. hip. God damn it. And then um, Andrew taught me how to line up my first music video through that video, and then that was my first video that music video that I ever cut. It took me like three days. I was so nervous, um, but it was an amazing experience. It it was it was so fucking cool, and I was on set for it too, DITing. Um, but yeah, it never came out, which is very sad. But if you don't know what DITing is, it's like <clears throat> media managing the data that's being collected on set. So camera, I just film a bunch of shit. I give her my card. She takes the card. Loads it into her computer, mm-hmm. dumps it onto a hard drive at a basic level. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I was doing a lot of DIT jobs with Andrew when I first started out with him. And I right. still am. So. Yeah. But now I'm getting paid for it. I think I got yeah. paid like 50 bucks for my first DIT yeah. job yeah. <laughs> with Andrew. Well, it's like at the same time, the, you know, I think it's like if you can find ways to fit in and do roles like you wanted to be an editor, but she's DIT, in which I'm not saying it. Out, it's like you want to get to a position where all you do is edit, right? Like eventually right. you have assistant editors setting up your projects for you so you can dive in and do your music yeah. videos. And sometimes that's even hard. I think we talked about it in like last Wednesday's podcast or whatever about delegating your time. Oh, yeah. But like there's like even a challenge right now. Like I just did this spot in New York and I wanted you to edit it. But the way I shot it was so last minute. It was so random. Like literally the creative came together like at the last minute. And the way we shot it was all over the fucking place. I'm like, it would probably take me more time to try to explain to you what this is. Yeah, exactly. Than for me to just cut shit out. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? But like me setting up my own project took time and me doing all this stuff. It like takes so much time. So if you can find ways to fit in, which for you, it's like, Oh cool. I can go DIT and I can load up, preload up a thing. If Andrew's going to edit it or whatever, like you add value to whoever you're working with. Always do that. I feel Mm -hmm. like that's like super, super key. Yeah, for sure. So, um, first music video you do doesn't come out, which is a fucking a bummer. Yeah. It's a huge bummer. I was so stoked because I hadn't edited anything legit in my opinion um yet and jojo first of all i grew up on jojo second of all like she's a fucking star it would be so sick to have that on my reel or on my website like that was like my first thing Mm -hmm. so i was like so devastated like every month had gone by and i was like it still hadn't come out yet still hadn't come out yet and i was like fuck but um eventually i did the jacob sartorius video and i think that was my first music video to come out right so that was like super, super exciting. And I worked with Andrew on that and that was dope. Which Jacob's like this dope little, uh, did little he get homie. popular on Vine? Huh? It was Vine his outlet? Oh no, it was um, Musical.ly. Musical.ly? Yeah, Musical.ly. He got famous on Musical.ly and then turned into, now he's, his girlfriend is uh, Eleven from Stranger. Oh, Millie Bobby Brown. Millie Bobby they Brown. They actually broke up. No, like, shit, it's a tragedy. Not Fuck. too long ago, you know. Just Shannon's on top of it. Yeah. <laughs> I've got She's the on tea. top of the teen. I've teen got the shit. tea. Um, yeah, she definitely does have a tea. Cool. So then, as things progress, it starts becoming kind of cool for us because we, like, for us, for me and Andrew, like, always working on projects together, you became like a trusted source. Like, mm-hmm. we knew that we could trust you to do almost anything. Like, yeah, I was reliable. Very. I wasn't like not. I wasn't like fucking everything up. Which opened up doors, and eventually, like, projects came through that we could actually pay you because, like, even if they're low budget things, we're like, oh, cool, here's money, and now you can get paid for certain things. What What changed for you as far as like going from one to two weeks meet up with Andrew to like consistently? Because eventually, you be, you're around us all the time. <laughs> I, yeah, I think once Andrew had more work to do, he just like kept me around to like help him out because I mean making music videos directing it and producing is so much work Mm -hmm. so having me around probably helped him out and that's why i started like hanging around more and andrew was kind enough to introduce me to so many other people in the industry like he introduced me to you obviously and like jr and like alex and like all these people so like that's when i started kind of like hanging around more you started Andrew was so busy <laughs> we like had shannon at one point we were i'm trying to think of it, the way this out the outline of this works i think it would be like 
certain things like little jobs, like sometimes we get them all the time where it's like, hey, can you do this like quick recap? And there's like trash ass budget and there's nothing to do. Like it's not enough where there's so much that happens so often when you're trying to do something bigger, like catch a bigger check that could support the team. So it's like you're focusing on that. And when you can start delegating those things out, like, oh, cool, we could divide this up. So Shane doesn't have to go and shoot this thing and edit this. Like here's some footage. Can you chop it up? It might take you an afternoon. Boom. Here's like a recap video. And someone else goes out and shoots that shit. We were able to delegate it that way and then like i loved how we started working with golden barbie yeah jasmine sanders shout out to her um how she's able to she does her youtube videos but like yeah. you even took that on which was that challenging because at the same time we were doing the doc oh uh, no not at all like doing golden barbie's vlogs is literally the most fun thing on earth like i love doing those vlogs like i love I'm interested in like all like makeup and like hair and like fashion and modeling and like all that stuff. So I love celebs. So it's not boring or like annoying at all. And I love it. And she's so funny. So it's, it's so fun and it takes no time at all. It's literally just like editing, watching her day and editing it together. Was that, did you ever have to like, do you ever have to like kind of almost direct her on certain things to help you get the story you want in the editing side? Cause she's filming all the videos. Yeah. You don't know what she's going to film. Yeah. Like, um, I do sometimes give her direction and I know that you did sometimes like I, I just tell her little things like, Oh, make sure you say hi. Hey guys in the beginning. And at the end say bye guys. That's what she was already kept like earlier. We were talking about it, like the three X structure. She was already doing that, doing that sort of like maybe yeah. unintentionally. Or- yeah. Sometimes like she'll just give me footage um, and she'll be like busy. So there's no real clear act structure. So it just becomes kind of like a mm-hmm. little video. Um, but yeah, sometimes she does like a beginning, middle, and end. And those are usually her best vlogs when she is like conscious of like the and story. of the story and or filming basically everything. Right. You know. So we get into the doc. I think you were on that right away. When yeah. We started I was. that, right? As an assistant editor and she was we went to fucking Ohio. This yeah. hasn't come out by the way yet, so soon you'll see the doc. Um we went to Ohio. Yeah. Chilled out there for like a fucking good week and a half. And I like, like to me, like for Chris's doc, I didn't come into Chris's doc and start, which I did the same thing. I was an assistant editor on his doc mm-hmm. and Chris Brown. So when they're telling Andrew had already started recording interviews and things like that. And so I missed a lot of that shit. So I'd like backtrack and, and as an editor, it's almost nice to like weigh in on your ideas. Like say for this, for Lewis's doc, you were able to weigh in on almost every conversation we had or ideas of how we should build his story, right? Yeah. So you were able to provide a lot of value on that side, whereas if you were to come in after we had already captured everything, yeah. you're dealt with the cards that we have versus what we could have got differently. Mm-hmm. Maybe you may see something as an editor like, oh, I really need you guys to talk about this specific thing. Like, Can we capture this? Yeah. So how did you feel? Do you feel like being there, I guess that was your first, this is your only doc that you've done or just the assistant editing or interning on previous docs? Well, I've done, my first internship was on a feature length doc. It's about like experimental film in the 1970s and 60s and 80s. It hasn't come out yet. Um, It's been 10 years in the making. Oh my God. I know. Um, But that was really interesting. So it's not my first doc. And that's why I was able, I feel like, to give so much value because I had this experience on this feature length doc. And when I was an intern on that feature length doc in New York, um, we had all the interviews transcribed, which is why I pressed so hard to get those interviews that we did transcribed. We also had like all this stuff like organized and like, you know, so all of my experience from that internship really helped for when we started our documentary what transcribed can you describe that to the people who made so it that? when you're working on a feature length documentary you're going to be doing interviews you're going to be filming so much stuff so getting stuff transcribed is super helpful basically you'll conduct the interview and like then you'll listen to the interview and type out every word that they say shannon was literally writing verbatim of what like I would ask a question to someone that we were interviewing. She's writing every single word down that they said and into a doc or a doc by yeah. herself. I think eventually we paid some yeah. company to like do it. Cause it was, she- it eventually was too much. And so I was doing it at first. I was just typing it and like, um, every, uh, every like every, um, I was typing it out, but, um, fucking insane. Yeah. But what do you use that? Like what's, so, how do you use that as a tool? Yeah. So I, know, I just like asking you. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> 
And then later when you're editing, if you're editing a section, for example, about basketball, you can go back to those documents and search keyword search basketball and you can see all the times that this person talks about basketball or multiple people eventually. Or, yeah, exactly. And that just, it helps you like see like, Oh shit, we actually do have a, a like a little audio section where they talk about basketball. Like, Oh, we, I missed this. Oh, I missed that. Like, it's super helpful super clutch. if you have if you're working on a feature length doc or if you're assisting like press that make sure you get that shit yeah and <laughs> like it's so worth it for if yeah. you're putting together your budget include that in the budget because that shit saves so much time eventually it was cool because you had like everybody's interviews in separate docs mm -hmm. and then we just combined all of them so it was just as simple as that like keyword searching basketball and you see that four people do it which helps you when you get to that section if if whatever whoever's talking about basketball at yeah. that time i don't know why we're talking about basketball but <laughs> if if this person was talking about basketball you get all these oh cool this guy said something around that topic that could fit this sentence and help yeah. us break it up a little bit or make yeah. it make more sense it just helps saves you time later like sometimes you have to invest and spend a lot of time in the beginning to save yourself time later totally when you're editing and like for example like if you have like a cut and you want to add stuff about basketball then and you don't have the transcripts then you have to like comb through and watch the footage or like jump through it like that would take forever right. as opposed to going and searching your document so it yeah that shit was super clutch, which I don't think we, I, I did that on Chris's doc. I want to say for a couple of the interviews that we had scooped up or maybe no, the earlier ones. Cause I was there for the other ones and we just didn't have time, but I, I went back and I would write them all out and it was so helpful to, but I was dumb and didn't understand. I wasn't thinking keyword search, my dumb ass. I would just print them out on paper and I was just like looking through, Oh my God. I was literally like crossing things out or circling like hot topics that could work and shit just instead of like pulling selects fucking dumb but that shit was mad helpful but um i loved like i feel like it was very beneficial to us too to all be like how i said being in the same space and having your input on it too mm -hmm. did you came in as an assistant editor to was it me and andrew supposed to co-edit it it didn't yeah. end up being what it started out as yeah so i think your contract says that you were gonna co-edit with andrew and code co-directed with Andrew and I was going to assistant edit. Right. But then since I had watched all the footage and that managed all of it, you were like, well, it only makes sense that I also edit it because I know I've seen all of it already. Yeah. And so. Andrew was also, he, he had started like, um, working with our friend Jordan Taylor cut films. And he was like helping him produce a bunch of his content at the time. So it was like a lot of multitasking. We were doing a lot of things. I think I was doing the podcast, all the shit and yeah. building out a couple other jobs. Yeah. At EA, and you were like, so di drove you were, super driven to execute very well in this documentary because wow. you're already starting to go through every interview and like yeah. outline everything but it helped to have you there and then andrew at the same point was like yo i think i'm just gonna let her be the co-editor with you and i was like all right cool and then we did it by the end of it we're like yo shannon edit that fucking movie that's like your your shit shannon fucking took control it was really fun clutch so process wise like could you talk a little bit about i'm trying to think of what things I could provide that would be interesting from that doc. Cause I feel like the doc is what we worked the most on that. How long did it take? We started cutting in October, November Fuck. or September. And then we finished it like a year later. I think, I think it took like a year. Yeah. Yeah. Cause we screened it in for CAA in June or July. And that was the final cut. That was the final cut. Yeah, everything is colored. Everything is composed and like mixed and stuff. So I think it took like took so a long. year. Yeah. Which is, which I think when we first took on the project, we assumed it would take like six months or something. Honestly, that was a t terrible timeline. Terrible, I feel yeah. like it's it takes at least a year to get yeah. a feature done. Especially yeah, Doc. <laughs> definitely it does. And we've done two already that take fucking way longer than this Doc did. So I don't know what we were thinking. Yeah. But I think we, I don't know. Yeah. You have to kind of have that balance of time and understand that it's going to take a little while. What do you think takes the most time when you're editing a Doc bes um, besides watching the footage? Yeah. Watching the footage takes the most time. Um, I think that is what takes the most time. Do you think it helped using the note cards? Note cards definitely or, help. Or sticky notes, sorry. Yeah, so we use like sticky notes and like a three act like structure to see how the story would play out. Like, and it's really helpful when you're trying to build a story because then you can actually see it and like 
edit it with like your sticky notes and like move it around and stuff. And but we that, started that early, like before yeah. we even shot anything. Yeah. For Andrew and I, it was like super, super important to get as much info that we could possibly get yeah. out of what we knew about Lewis because we went to start the film. Man, it sucks that no one can watch this right now to understand what we're talking about. You'll see it. I'll, I'll make an announcement when it comes <laughs> out. But to, to know, like, we knew our subject, and then we knew the people we were going to interview for this film, and it helped, like, we dove in and tried to figure out as many fun facts that we could already get out of other interviews, and then things that we could ask that haven't maybe been asked yet that could tie into Lewis's story and this overall story of our film, which helped a lot. So we were in Andrew's studio apartment at one point, like with yeah. these sticky notes everywhere. I feel like that's like, it doesn't take the longest, but that's definitely the hardest part is like coming up with a story. Cause then you're, you're just like, where do you even start? You have so much in, like information. You also have to do research. It's just like, oh my God, it's so much work, but yeah. it's so worth it. I fucking love it. I know. Cause it, you end up building a piece that like it's, has a lot of value. Yeah. It's so satisfying. I, I hate that word. Why? Cause satisfying. you always say, yeah, you always say, oh, this is so satisfying. Should, should we talk about, for the rest of the podcast in ASMR voice. ASMR. I just showed, I just watched part of the Cardi B ASMR yesterday. Did you see it yet? I can't really do it. <laughs> She's doing it into two different mics. And she started like scratching one mic and my friend Whitney was like, what the fuck is she doing? Why is she grabbing it? I'm like, you don't know ASMR? Oh my God. I love ASMR. Should I start a po- ASMR podcast? <gasps> Ooh. You should. Don't put this in the podcast so someone steals your idea. Today, we are going to be talking about editing. <laughs> ASMR is dope that's, as fuck. Honestly, that's a great idea. That is a good idea. That's a fucking like, good idea, yo. We should do like ASMR Wednesdays or something. Like today, we're gonna give out tips, like an ASMR. I already have the morning roast on Wednesdays, which is like a twenty-minute motivational, like deep dive into a topic. Oh, so shit. should I do that in ASMR? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're today, gonna, you're gonna I want to do it with the ear one. Like you know, have you seen the mic that they built that has two ears on it? What? You know how they're like. It's like whispering in your ear, yeah. ASMR. They made like a microphone because it's two mics. Oh, that looks that, like an ear. Yeah, it has the shape of an ear. So then they'll like rub on your ear. Yeah, or, or like they'll whisper. suck it. They'll suck on your ear oh, and shit. There's so I many. I don't like that ASMR. ASMR is dope. So check out ASMR if you're not, yeah, if like, you're not fucking with um, it. You should do one where you're like, you know how like Lewis House does five minute Fridays? Yeah. You could do like five minute Fridays, but it's like ASMR. So people are, like, people are waking up and they're like, oh, I need to be motivated. And then they listen to it and it's you being like, That shit like makes me feel fucking weird. Yeah, (laughs) that'd be sick. Watching ASMR being recorded is like a super weird thing. Yes, uh, I really think if you push yourself, (laughs) you give it your all. It's lit, fam. All right, let's 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 stop talking about this. So, you did you cut Wilmer's TV thing that he did with Fuse? Oh, we did some we did some promos for um uh his puppet show hollywood puppet shit show um andrew and i edited that together andrew did i think the rough cut for some of for one and then i finessed it a little bit and then i did the rough cut for the other two and then he finessed it a little bit and then i assistant edited both i delivered the assets to fuse i made sure that they were gucci so that's the work that i did on that and i think i also dit'd did you help us no never mind that's different this is a different thing. What was it where you were you were like delivering assets at that? Remember, you would go back and forth to that one spot. Oh, to Viacom. What was that for? Oh, it was for the Mary J. Blige documentary. You did deliver that shit. Yeah, I, damn. So you was, came in at the end of Mary's doc. Yeah. So I can, Yeah, I did some work on the end of your Mary J. Blige documentary. You guys were just finishing it up, and then um, you needed to de- to deliver it to Viacom, and we had that late night, late last night, where Lauren made us dinner, and we had no idea what we were yes. doing, and then I went to Viacom, and they showed me how to deliver it, and God then we damn. had to re-deliver some assets, so yeah, shout out to Jeff from Viacom. <laughs> he was so nice, so, so nice, like, he told me how to, how to deliver files, like, to a major broadcast company, and for free, like, he didn't, he did it out of the kindness of his own heart. Thank you, Jeff from Viacom. You're yeah, a real one. Thank you, Jeff. My guy. I don't know you. <laughs> I, I wonder what he's doing now. I he's still think about it. He's probably delivering shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? He, he sits in Viacom and he watches things that are delivered to Viacom the, in entirety. To Q, he QCs it. Oh, shit. And then he gives it the okay to broadcast. God like, he damn. literally watches it. He watches it like this. He watches, like, shows. He watches, like, Real Housewives or, I don't know, something like that. 
I'm just like, don't they? What can't a they dope have ass ro- job. I know, but like, can't they have like robots just do this? Like, why does it have to be like a human person? Well, I mean, shouldn't it just be us? Like, if we're like, hey, this file's been QC'd and it's good to go, like, then the, that should. I mean, well, they have to QC the I our know. QC. That's weird. Yeah. Well, then we should let the yeah fuck. Um. Okay. So doc, we finished the doc. Yeah. I guess we're not telling your story. Anymore. It's still like this current time. Like the doc <laughs> just finished. Like literally. Like we're pretty weird. Much, yeah, I feel like we're in present though. day now. We are in present day. The do you prefer docs would you do another one knowing how long yeah. it takes i would love to do another one yeah it's really fun i love it it's like very painful i it's like it's like delivering a baby but like because i just like i would love to do it all over again you just forget how painful it was you yeah know? i've never delivered a baby before but i <laughs> i think that it's an accurate metaphor I'm sure you know yeah i could feel that if you if you had delivered a baby please confirm with me i've then technically delivered three babies what Docs. Oh, right. Exactly. Shit Congratulations. Was, shit was tough. Thanks. I went through it. <laughs> Sweated a lot. I really do think it's it's like very, I mean, it's so emotionally containing and it like really fucks you up for a while. Like, yeah. It's nonstop hours. Sometimes. This doc would have been impossible without you. Sometimes, like I think when I'm editing anything, even a music video or a doc, I'm just like, why did I do this to myself? Like it's late hours just like sometimes adobe fucks up and like doesn't work shout out adobe shout get out your shit together pc um <laughs> yeah like sometimes you just it's just so much work and sometimes i'm just like why did i do this to myself is it worth it but then af- after you finish it you're just like damn it's so fucking worth it you know what i mean why though i don't know like it's just it's fucking sick it's fucking dope like making shit that people watch that's dope that's dope. right yeah. like no, when yeah. i'm you asking know, you i just want to yeah. Do, yeah do you like how's your family what do they think about the shit um well our I friends don't, or whoever like my i don't know what my if my grandma even knows what i'm doing but like um i don't know my mom and my dad thankfully have been so supportive of me they just like think it's cool that i'm doing what i do um and getting paid for it was it military or something was that why you guys were no no um my dad he was he works for otis elevators and he was in connecticut because they had like i guess a headquarters there or something Mm. and then he had an opportunity to move to china to work in otis there and that's where that's why we moved right and then my mom wanted to move to hawaii so then we moved to hawaii i know because i mean yeah yeah why not? They still live in Hawaii. My mom still lives in Hawaii and my dad is still in China. Um, and my sister is in New York right yeah, now. You guys are all over the fucking my, place. My sister's in New York saving the world right now. She's fucking lit. You should have her on the podcast. Oh, she like, do? She um, works for... Superman? Uh, no. She was interning for Batman she, and Superman? She works for this um, this like women's rights uh, group. I forget what they're called. They're really famous and they're really big. It's like a nonprofit or something. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a nonprofit. She does lots of nonprofit work. She like canvases. She like calls people when there's like elections and stuff. She's, she's fucking dope. It's a brutal job. Yeah. It's crazy. That shit's emotionally draining. Yeah. Fuck our doc. I know. So now you just did the Olivia O'Brien music videos. How long, when, how were those back to back? Like, yeah, those are back to back. Cause I think she had like a contract or something with under wonder, like, Oh, let's do two videos together. Right. Yeah. So that what was, was sick. The, what was the process of that? Um, well, Andrew brought me on to edit those, which was amazing. He, I, I love working with Andrew. Andrew is like, we just click Yeah. and he just lets me do my thing. He lets me edit and then he'll have notes or something. And then that's it. Like it's, we just have like a great process. So I love working with him and I love working with all the people that he brings on and stuff. He just has like a great energy that he brings to set. And he's, he's very, very smart. Like he knows what to do with a budget. He knows how to cre- be creative within like the ba- like artistic bounds that like he's given. It's just like, it's dope working with him. Um, but yeah, so I was on set for that. We had like an overnight shoot, I think from like 4 p.m. to 4 a.m. I managed the media. This is so what did they do? They shot both of them in the same. Time no, frame? no, no. This was we did one video at a time. Got it. So for the I don't exist video, we shot it somewhere in L.A. And then it was an overnight shoot. I managed the media. And then I think that I had a, a, a day to make the proxies because I was just do, doing them off of my laptop. So it was super slow. Um, and then the next day I edited it, the whole thing. And then the next day I worked with Andrew with his notes 
and we worked till like 9 p.m. I think we had some wine and then um crucial yeah and then crucial need after that we sent it to frank the executive producer and owner of under wonder content and then he gave us a a few notes before sending it to olivia and then we did his notes and then after that we sent it to olivia and then olivia had notes and then after her notes we sent to color and we did all the vfx and then boom it came out god damn yeah it was it was cool it was really fun i don't exist video has 1.2 million views how's that feel it's pretty cool. I can't believe like 1 million people have seen this video. 356,000 people have seen the other one. That's cool. That's only like a couple days old. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, she makes she makes like really good songs. Do Certified through, slapper. Do you ever look through the comments and try to see if anyone talks about the edit? Um, sometimes like I, I'm, I'm too weak for YouTube. Like I hate YouTube comments. I could never be a YouTuber. I just take everything so personally. Like you don't like this comment from food idiot that says perfect face, perfect body, perfect voice. How is she so underrated? (laughs) You don't ever just feel like giving a little conversation with this guy. Yeah. I love it. (laughs) Damn. I I remember when all the Chris videos started coming out and it's like, it happens so quick that you don't even realize that it affects people like that. Your work is affecting people you get all these comments and all these people like reacting to these videos or like yeah my favorite is if you if you ever get lucky enough to see this shit i remember watching this guy review one of chris's videos that we did yeah and he just like is playing it and reacting to it and the reacting video is so fucking funny <gasps> oh my god i gotta watch it he's just like what the fuck is this oh, oh shit chris is walking over to a girl blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and he's like reacting to it and we literally had just finished it like the night before it came oh, out shit. so it's like wow like no one was seeing this and it was like super exclusive and now this fucking guy is yeah. like telling us what he thinks about this yeah. shit. Yeah. The other day I was at Nocturnal Effects with JR um, and he he did the VFX um, with Kavika for the Cardi B Ring video featuring Kaylani and he saw a video that was just like roasting the shit out of it. Out he, of the VFX? Out of, no, out of the, out of the edit. Video. They were like, why is there phones here? Why why is she like performing in this rock area? Blah, blah. It was literally just like shitting on it all oh over God. it. And JR thought it was hilarious he was dying he i think he sent it to mike the mike ho the director it was it was really funny you've been working with nocturnal a bit lately yeah lately what have like, you been doing with them They're literally VFX. jr um the is he a c is it jr are you a ceo i don't know he but owns J- that yeah, shit JR owns- why'd you look at the camera that's pointed towards me <laughs> I don't know. I wanted, do. I wanted to look at all of them. But yeah. <laughs> JR, are you the owner? <laughs> but yeah, like, um, J- I was literally just making spaghetti one day at, at home. And then J- I got a call and it was JR. And he was like, hey, do you want to come um, work with me today? I've heard so much about you from Kavika. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. And he was like, do you even know who I am? And I was like, yes. And so... Now I work with JR. I help him with some VFX. Like I'll assist him. He's been teaching me how to like help him with VFX. Um, sometimes he'll have edits come in and he doesn't have time to do it. So I'll help or I'll right. do a rough cut or I'll edit. Um, Nocturnal Effects is like a VFX company, but I think they also edit. Yeah, it's well basically sometimes. a post house. Yeah, post house. Yeah, so it's it's really cool. We're trying to figure out um, if we get a space together. Jared, do you want to still do that? I mean, we're thinking about, like, I like the idea of getting, since it's like a creative collective, like, we're all bouncing jobs off of each other anyway. Yeah. Like, getting one massive house that is, like, just the spot where we all work. We should all just, like, you know how in the Olympics where um, they all... <laughs> I want to know where this is going. <laughs> you know how, like, all the sports players for the Olympics have to live in, like, an Olympic village, like, when they go to these places? I didn't know that. Yeah, so when they have the Olympics, like for example, when they have the Olympics in Brazil, all these athletes come, they have to stay somewhere. So they create an Olympic villa, village, where all the athletes stay in one spot. So they don't have to like, you know, live in like random spots and hotels and stuff. So it's just like a bunch of tents. Yeah. And they all sleep in the tents. (laughs) No, not tents, but like (laughs) a facility or whatever. So we should have one where it's just like all... 10 of us like we all live yeah just all live live, just all live in like one little like compound and like work at the same time and then also film a reality show about yeah yeah pretty lit exactly would you no i don't want to do that i think that we need to separate work from home but I feel like we always bring work home. You're constantly working from home. We are literally well, filming I don't, this. It's not ideal. I don't. We are filming this in my kitchen right now. I don't want to be in my kitchen. <laughs> this shit true. looks dumb as fuck. The video looks so dumb to me. Like I Aww. need to. It's just this 
picture that my homie Scotty made. Shout out to Scotty, Perspective oh, Collective. Aw. But I'm just saying, like, yeah. I want to create an aesthetic and I can't do that yeah, in my kitchen. Yeah, that's true. I have to tear all this down as soon as we get done. That's like, true. It's my living room. That's true. But I love the idea of, for sure, Andrew's mindset is this. Like, he loves being able to, like, clock out. Like, if he can go home, even though I know he's still working, like, he likes to at least be able to go home and have his moments there. Have his me time. <laughs> have his me time. But... I think getting a space that we could all go to and be creative, even though it's multiple companies. Like I mm-hmm. love the idea of that being a spot where we could just go create a living room. Could be like a creative boardroom. You know what yeah, I mean? Like, yeah. Being around like creatives or fellow creatives or people that are doing like similar shit that you want to do is so fucking important. Mm-hmm. It's just like opens up a whole world for you. Collabs become like more yeah. important. I guess it's so. like when you think about like, okay, am I going to go hang out with this friend who like just smokes weed all the time and like does nothing? Or am I going to go hang out with this friend who may also smoke weed, but does more shit? Like what is going to give you more opportunity? You know what I mean? Like, are you going to just do nothing or like be around people who like do shit? Right. Like it's, it's just like going to open up your world and like it might give you more opportunities than you think as opposed to just like sitting in your house alone, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I mean, we should look at that. I think that's New Year's goals. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I've been looking at some houses. I think it'd be dope. It'd be fucking dope. Um, all right. So I let Black Window Cream community ask you questions. Okay. Word. I think you've looked at a few of them. You don't have to spend a lot of time on all these. I just wanted to kind of give, give you a quick like bang, 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 bang. You know what I mean? <laughs> so... Wait, first off, I feel like we covered everything. Did we? I don't know. Do you, do you feel like we we left something out? What haven't we talked about? Mm, I don't know. I think that's it. These, I think, are going to be like direct questions about specific things. And yeah. I read a lot of them. Like, Well, are you still curious about other things? or? Yeah. Oh, being a woman in the industry. Oh, yeah. Fuck, let's chat about that. Yeah. I also, this is fucking crazy because you're the second girl that's ever been on my podcast. You should have more. I would love to have more. Yeah. She just said she's going to introduce me to her homie who directs videos. I would love to have her on yeah. here. I'm going to watch your stuff. Yeah. Too. Sorry. Yeah. But yeah. Um, I have, a, I have, I, I like, I've been building it since I got home from tour. I have like my Rolodex of people that I've been wanting to get on here. So now it's just about fucking time. Like, yeah, uh, but exactly. Obviously. Yeah. Being like, thankfully I'm around a lot of people who don't make me feel like I am like a woman in the industry like I'm around you and I'm around Andrew and around JR and around all these people who like don't um who make me feel like I'm just a creator with you guys but there are a lot of people in the industry that like I've talked to who are also women who said they've been on sets before where they've like felt like they were being like talked down to or people thought that they couldn't do the job and it's not like they said like oh well you're a woman so I'm not gonna hire you or you're a woman and like you can't do this they just it's little things like little like digs or like little insinuations Mm. like for example like my friend is a production designer which is backbreaking work you have to build you have to use drills which is stuff that I hate and like people constantly are like doubting her like oh you know how to like drill you know how to like do Pick this up a two by four blah, yeah blah. you know how to do th- and she's constantly battling people who say stuff like that and it's maybe they don't mean it in that way but like it's stuff like that that like makes women feel unwelcome in the industry and like thankfully i haven't really experienced it that much um but it's definitely like an issue mm-hmm. that like other people have experienced and it's and it sucks so bad because like i feel like it should be like a community where like we all create together and we all come up together you know what i mean so but i feel super lucky that i'm in a position that i'm in and i can't wait to give that opportunity to another woman or another oh, yeah. person that like you know what i mean it's it's gonna be sick have you been looking for other women like editors that are in the come up or like well i love you know i love taylor tracy's work i love like jacqueline london's work jen kennedy's work they're all amazing women editors and i wish that i want to work with more women directors like i just started working with roxana baldovin who's a sick director she's so creative i just started working with cassie brooks bank as her assistant editor and i just started working with ivana boren there's just so many people out there all so many women out there that people don't really know about and it's mind-blowing because they're fucking killing it every day Mm -hmm. so i can't i feel like when i'm on set i'm usually like the only woman which is fucking crazy well it's like such a male driven 
industry where it's like I feel like it is always like that. Like the, I've had forty. This is my forty. So, so fucking four maybe 43 i don't know what episode number this is but two women that's mm-hmm. it but yeah. it's also because a majority of my friends are guys in this industry that yeah. i've connected with there isn't very many women that you run into on set like you said but it's funny because like when i was on roxana's set she <clears throat> the the set that she had was like half women half men like a lot of the people there were met it was it was interesting to me that that was refreshing mm. like why is it so hard to get that like she she did it easily. She right. found like so many women who could do the job, who right. did it great. And it's the producer, the director, me, the editor, the art director, the production designer. So many people were women. Mm-hmm. And it's f- mind blowing that people still have sets where like that isn't like that isn't happening. Because right. the real world is like that. Like half women, not, oh, not half and half exactly. Yeah. But like, it's funny that like it's still all men i feel like people aren't trying to meet people who are women you right. know what i mean it's it's just weird no i'm with that that's that's why i would love for i need to i would love to interview more women that are in it but also it's the same thing because like when you show up to a set it's almost always a bunch of dudes the women are usually yeah it's kind of like a artist or something it's a weird cycle because you only when you meet only men then you only know men then like you know what i mean so it's like um we have to go and make out, make like an effort to go and like look for people who right. are women or like who aren't usually on set. You know what I mean? Or find people who are willing and to we work also, with women. Yeah, we also have to think about our biases like that are unchecked. Like, what am I? Are, am I when I'm hiring people? Like, how am I like perceiving them? You know what I mean? Or like checking to make sure that we're not making assumptions based off of nothing. You right. know what I mean? Like. Um, for example, with the production designer that is my friend, like some people look at her and they're like, oh, sh- how could she possibly do this job? She's like 5'3". But like, we need to check those. Like, am I making an assumption about her because she's like a five foot three woman or is she actually going to be able to do a good job? Right. You know what I mean? So we have to also just be mindful of that just to make sure, just so that we're welcoming and open to ideas. It's just about being open. You know what I mean? So what advice would you give to a young woman that's trying to get into this industry? Um, I would say trust your gut. Um, just keep going. And if people give you shit, just be like, why are you giving me shit? I'm just trying to learn. <laughs> Okay. You know what I mean? Because I feel like people, there are a lot of women who are afraid to ask stupid questions because they want to seem like capable. You know right. what I mean? But I met a lot of men who aren't afraid to ask stupid questions. And I feel like if people are giving you shit for asking a dumb question that you don't know, just be like, why are you being that way? I'm just like trying to learn. Right. Exactly. You know what I mean? So don't be afraid to ask stupid questions. Oh, also apply to jobs that you may not be qualified for. Because when I applied to Andrew's position, assistant editor position, he was like, you need to know the entire Adobe suite. I did not know the entire Adobe suite. I did not know Photoshop. I still don't really know it that much, but I still applied and I fucking got it. Yeah, you you figured it out. So just apply to jobs that you may not even be qualified for. Right. Like my dad and my mom instilled in me from like a really young child, like, you never know. Just do it. Like my dad. Okay. This was a little crazy. He was like, you should apply to Harvard. You never know. I'm just like, dad, stop. Like, but it's kind of true. Like you never know. Like might as well just try, just yeah. test your assumptions. Right. Like, um, did you apply to Harvard? No, they probably do. Math I didn't there. even want to go Fuck to Harvard. Yeah. Fuck I didn't want to go to Harvard anyway. Yeah. Me either. But yeah, like, um, just like one of the things that I love is testing your assumptions. Like there's so many times where like, I'm like, Oh, I could never work there because like, they're all so dope. And like, I'm not, but is that true? Like, what is that based off of? Nothing. Yeah. Is that, is that based on facts or is it based off of something that I made up in my mind? So like, think, just test your assumptions. I think is like one of like the greatest advice I could give out. I love that. I love that. It's lit. Um, who do you look up to? That's, uh, in the industry, killing it from a directing standpoint and, and editing, women wise. I guess you named off a couple of editors. You've already said that. Oh, yeah. I named off a couple of editors. So I also that? like Bill Yukich. Is that how you pronounce his name? That's so bad. But yeah, like he's really cool. And I, yeah, I love all of their work. No, women. Oh, women? Sorry. Oh. Shout out to Bill. But I was like, <laughs> Sorry, who, Bill. who are like maybe three? Do you have any three favorite directors, women directors that you would recommend people start paying attention to their work? Um, definitely be on the lookout for Roxana Baldovin, Senora Directora. She's fucking lit. She's so cool. And she's so creative and her sets are like mostly women. She's fucking sick. Like 
I, I just love working with her and she's cool and she has a cute cat so tight but yeah I love uh, who else do I love I love Taylor Tracy's work I would love to meet her one day she's, me too she's dope she's so sick she's fucking killing it and like I love Jacqueline London's work I love Jen Kennedy's work like they just like make such cool shit and also I I love Beyonce I'm not just saying that because you work with her like every time I need inspiration I fucking watch lemonade like over and over and over again like it's it's so fucking amazing it's nuts yeah but that's something that i watch all the time if i'm ever feeling like creatively in a rut then i watch lemonade (laughs) i watch lemonade (laughs) yeah okay questions from the community um everyone wants to know what you edit with sean saucy says i obviously want to know what she edits with now or is she hesitant to use or switch to other programs if she's if do you use multiple programs um i still using final cut i just i use premiere pro cc i use um media encoder davinci resolve sometimes but it's mostly premiere pro um and then um i used to i used to edit off of avid like a long ass time ago when i was interning on that feature length documentary it was forever ago but i've totally forgot it and i don't use it ever um and i used to use final cut pro 7 when i was first starting out and i loved that and i started using final cut pro 10 shortly after that for like wedding videos and stuff when i was working in hawaii final cut pro 10 is really great for wedding videos like it's honestly the perfect tool because really? their multicam feature uh, right. is perfect like it would honestly be perfect for this setup yeah. because it's super easy like it processes your footage super fast it has automatic renders and you can multicam three angles mm. with one audio and then you can cut really fast right Premiere Pro's multicam feature is lacking compared yeah. to Final Cut Pro 10. Damn. So I, yeah, I used to use Final Cut Pro 10 all the time. I loved it, and I still do. Like I would use it if someone needed me to. But I hard use tip it. for Nikos. Well, when you're watching this, maybe yeah, maybe we get Final Cut 10. But yeah, so um, and you pay for it like once, I think, and that's it. So right. that's really nice. That's nice. Um, but yeah, so I only use Premiere Pro, and it's only based off of what people need. Yeah, yeah. I feel like it's kind of like the industry lead right now. Yeah, exactly. So Cor- a couple of people have kind of asked the same question, but Corey Sparks and Joshua Grees? Grits? Gut? Tears? Easy? Sound it out. I don't want to sound it out. Uh, they both are kind of asking about the way you edit, because I posted a, a Timeline Tuesday picture that you posted. Yeah. And so they were like, could she break down the pancake timeline? Um, Corey asked that, and Josh said, the project file looked crazy neat. How does she organize her project files when she's doing a big video, docs and music videos? Like, could you quickly describe like an out like what you would do as far as like setting up your projects or what how you prefer it to be yeah. and edit well every project requires different types of organization like for example if i do a wedding video versus a vlog versus a recap video versus a doc or a music video it's all different right but generally i put all my footage in a footage folder and then i put all my audio in an audio folder and then i just organize it by scene and then i just put it in my timeline I layer on top of it and then I just like start cutting you do you pull selects ever sometimes I pull selects yeah it depends on what how much time I have like if the deadline is like tomorrow then I don't have time to pull selects yeah yeah um but yeah the pancake timeline like you don't have to do that it's all it means is you're putting a timeline on top of another timeline in premiere right and then you can drag the footage onto your other timeline very fast instead of like copy pasting that's right. literally all it means yeah. but you don't have to use it at all like every process is different let's see um all the tutorials he says this one's gonna be dope fire 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 andrew says Josh. legend uh ian delone deloney or i think he says he's hyped for this one shannon's always cooking up some heat he said was one of the most important lessons she's learned in the last few years can be editing related or just life and networking related She's thinking. Right now. <laughs> she's, she's thinking right now. I'm thinking. I've learned so much. I've learned so much. It's coming to her, her frontal <laughs> vortex, or whatever the fuck people say. <laughs> um, I've learned a lot. I guess one of the things that I've learned is um to be is to take constructive criticism and to be mindful of who you're editing for. Mm. So a lot of creators are like, and I thought this way when I was first starting out too, is like, 
um, when you edit something, you think it's perfect as it is, but then your director or somebody comes in and is like, oh, well, I want this shot instead, or can we cut faster here, cut slower here? And you think, like, that is so fucking stupid. Like, yeah. I don't want that. This is perfect the way it is. And you want to argue with them, and you want to, like, be like, no, this is, like, the, my perspective, and, like, I need to have autonom- autonomy as a creator and stuff, but you can't do that. Right. Like, you are editing for somebody. Who are you getting paid by? Somebody else. Like, the only time I feel like you have full creative control is if you have your own YouTube channel. You know what I mean? Yeah, or if it's your project. If yeah, you're or, project. yeah, or if it's your, your project, you're funding it or something. You know what I mean? But if you're editing for a client or a recap video for, you know, somebody sick or even, like, for Beyonce, like, you have to be mindful of what they're saying and you can't just like knock it down right away like be open to what they say and like at least hear them out and people will want to work with you more if you are like that like they just want to be heard Mm -hmm. you know what i mean like don't be like a dick and be like no absolutely not you know because that's just kind of life shattering when 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 you think you're at it is the shit and then they're like nah this needs to do this and this and this yeah what the fuck but like almost always ends up being a great piece of yeah game. like it does suck when that happens like you know there have been times even now when people don't like my edit or like they think they could do it better or blah right. blah or they have notes like it sucks when you have to like go and change something that you think is like perfect or whatever but ultimately just just fucking do it you know what i mean unless yeah. it's like you know something like really crazy or i don't know yeah okay that's a fucking fire tip fire tip uh let's see what else do we got here i'll ask like two more um general workflow we've talked about that fernando says hell yeah it's gonna be dope dope funny oh yeah i don't know what he's talking about <laughs> someone the other day on set was telling me that i should be a stand-up comedian and i was like no fucking way i could see i could see it i think i could see it <gasps> no you she'd just be like uh so anyway like bop musics are bop <laughs> t i got the bag <laughs> to say any trendy fucking thing all right isaac Hussein, I don't know. He says, how does she stay relevant with her editing as new styles or trends or of editing comes up? Um, well, I watch a lot of what other people are working on. Um, I feel like that's a really good way to start. Just see what everyone else is doing. Like, don't compare yourself like, oh, like, I wish I was doing that. Or like, oh, when will I be that? Like, don't like compare yourself to other people or like don't copy people, but it's good to, to watch other people's stuff just to see, you know, like new styles forming and stuff. And like, you might have a client that's like, Oh, I really want this like Gibson hazard type, like, right. video. you know what I mean? So like that definitely helps. Um, but ultimately what really, what really matters is what's in your heart. <laughs> But it's true, like, what, it's, like, your perspective, what you think is dope, like, don't be, like, too caught up on, like, being, like, the dopest or the trendiest or, like, right. the newest, you know, ever. Yeah. Like, ultimately, it's about storytelling. You don't have to necessarily reinvent the wheel. Well, and I think apply those techniques when they need to be applied. Like, Yeah, that's true. You don't need, if you are a fan of Gibson shit, Gibson shit might not work for a wedding recap. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like could you imagine like a thousand clips in 30 seconds of a, of oh someone trying to say I do? Like you, it just doesn't work. Yeah. You you aren't that's not the vibe for that. Yeah. So you need to apply these tricks at that's certain times. super true. Like I saw like this music not this music video, this commercial that used like glitch transitions for no reason and I was like <laughs> why is it glitching like it's very clear that they did it because glitching is very cool right now and like they probably had an rg preset you know just sitting there but so yeah definitely do it when it's applicable okay i have one more question and it is damn it i forgot it oh shit it was a fire question too i think did you think about it earlier um i was thinking about it before we start you started answering that last uh oh i know what it is (laughs) ha 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 ha! Fuck you, dysnomia. My short-term memory loss, you bitch. Um, what do you do when you have creative writing block or whatever you want to call this? Like when you oh, cannot like a, be a creative. What, um, do you, what is what is like one thing that you do to try to like besides watching Beyonce videos? What is one thing that you do to like reset and then st- take a stab? I think that's like when you're in a rut, you're kind of like too into your mind at that point. You're just like stuck in whatever like syndrome that you're dealing with. So Mm -hmm. I think going out, you know, being a human being and like talking to people and like going to the ocean, going to the beach, 
um, doing like real world like activities and stepping away from like your creativity or your, like your edits or your work like will really help give you like more perspective. I think that's like major key alert. Yeah, I think too many people like stay trying to do their edit like they don't step away. And I think yeah. when you can learn to step away and allow yourself some time to like go to the gym or go to wherever you're going to be able to come back with a new mindset of something or see it different than you would if you were just to say i need to work for eight hours straight i need to yeah keep exactly and sometimes when you fall asleep i like um like think of edits in my sleep so i'm like oh perfect i fixed it and then i can go out yeah, so maybe crazy. take a nap <laughs> take a nap too okay cool well that's a fucking good ass interview thanks Lit. bye no i'm bye. joking <laughs> uh, how do you want to end this um if everyone could please get on your instagram right now and follow shannon her instagram is <laughs> at shannon griffin or is it no it's at shannon c griffin c griffin yeah what's the c for chintana oh that's my middle name chintana chintana yeah chin, like chin, chin. chintana yeah cool. that's my mom's name it means fantasy she needs to start a podcast <laughs> called chintana yo that would be lit fantasy Hello, another day of fantasy with Shintana. Um, follow her on Instagram. Check out her website to see some of her work. I, I'll put the links in the show notes. And uh, yeah, anything else you want? More work is coming soon. Yep, always. Mm-hmm. I let everyone, when they do a podcast, um, use a hashtag so that if anyone listened this far, they can... I tell them to go to your last Instagram post and then put the hashtag whatever you said and tag me at ben reverse world mm-hmm. tag me in it so i know that we both know that they made it this far mm-hmm. what do you want the hashtag to be um i know what one i want for this but i want you you can have one um hashtag uh no you have to say one hashtag uh okay <laughs> Mine was going to be like hashtag Shannon ASMR. Oh, that's a good one. Or Shannon and Ben ASMR. But I think hashtag uh is the fire, the fire choice. So yeah, hashtag uh maybe four H's and um, tag me in it so we know that you listen to this shit because you're a real one. And yeah. that's it. And- I think the last thing I want to say is that I'm not like where, like I haven't like made it yet. Like I still have Oh, sorry. Some... That's it. We don't have any more time. <laughs> <laughs> like, I still, I feel like I still have so much more to learn and so much more to grow. And, but this is like what I've learned so far. You know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. We should do a follow up uh, with you, me, Andrew, maybe Mike. We should do like five of us. Get Alex to come through and do a podcast when Lewis's doc comes out. <laughs> yeah. That'd I'm down. Fun. All right, cool. All right. Any, how, how do you want to end it any questions no we just did that <laughs> i love them yeah if you have questions dm her but how do you want to end it say goodbye or something um bye oh we'll just change we'll clink our glasses oh with like can we do something asmr oh, how the fuck do you oh you want to put like the mic next to it yeah like can we clink like like can we click the mic too yes. does that sound like a good way to wake up. This is the weirdest way I've ever ended the And then podcast. Um, we can say like, goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you for listening. See you later. She's giving me weird chills. <laughs> done ba 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 that's it for episode 44 with shannon griffin thank you for tuning in and listening make sure to follow shannon on instagram at shannon c griffin so you can start fucking with what she's doing you can find all our social links in the show notes visit bwnc.com slash podcast for that shit and if you watch this shit on youtube drop a review in the comments if you listen on itunes leave us a review in the review page so people know that we are lit and if you're interested in joining bwnc just go to bwnc.com slash join we would love to have you in our private community of creators merch store is currently shut down but i'll get some things out soon i know i've been saying that for a few weeks but it'll happen follow us on instagram at black window cream follow my lame ass at ben rovers world and subscribe to us on every platform possible turn on those notifications you motherfucker uh all right that's it i'll see you next wednesday for another episode cool see you next week you bitch, bitch.